Okay, we're going to get started. So on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and the City of Independence, welcome to First Friday. Before we get started, we always like to thank our business sponsor. And today we have three business sponsors. We have, as you can tell in your program, the Tri-County Interlocal, USD 446, and Greenbush. So um, I would like to introduce and just let them stand, and then we'll just clap for them and thank them. Um, Stacy Clarkson, who is here representing Greenbush. We have Deb Fox, who is representing for USD 446. And we have Julie Brewington, who is representing Tri-County Interlocal. Thank you, ladies and your staff. And thank you so much for being our business sponsor and bringing our speaker to us today. Um, as I always say, they are the reason why you all get to enjoy the warm muffins and the fresh fruit and the hot coffee from... Oh, and Rusty, sorry, Rusty. Hello there. And Rusty Arnold, our superintendent, is here. So thank you, Rusty. But they are the reason why you're enjoying this breakfast. So um, thank you for that. And there are plenty of muffins and fruit and coffee. This is a relaxed event, so feel free to get up, grab another bottle of water, and refill your plate at any time that you would like. Um, like I said, First Friday is co-sponsored by the City of Independence and the Chamber of Commerce. And it's a, an opportunity for us to get together every month and just gather in the Civic Center and listen to speakers, give us updates about what's going on in the community. And at the end of the event, um, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. So we hope that you find today very beneficial. We have three great speakers that are going to be sharing lots of good information with you. Speaking of information, turn your programs over. You're going to see a lot of information. Information overload on the back of your programs is a very detailed calendar of the next couple of months. So there's no excuse to not know what's going on in the community and don't dare say there's nothing going on in independence. Um, let me point out a few things. We all know that Little House on the Prairie is um, uh, open and ready for business. Um, there's a couple days left of the production of Mr. Burns at Independence Community College. There will be a performance tonight and on Saturday at 7 o'clock. It's an outside performance, which is very unusual. So um, I've seen some posting on Facebook, but I encourage you to all get out and check that out. That's tonight and tomorrow. This afternoon, you can um, show up at G&W Foods, our new grocery store in town, and welcome them to Independence. They're going to have a ribbon cutting at 11 o'clock, and then they're also serving a free lunch to the community of hot dogs and brats and chips and drinks and ice cream. So um, I encourage you all to get out and support them, welcome them to Independence, eat some lunch, and buy some groceries. If you see some possibly unfamiliar faces if you're young, and maybe some familiar faces if you're older, um, IHS is having their Alumni Association reunion this weekend, and they are all here in full force. So extend some independence hospitality to them if you happen to see some alumni. They are being um, hosted by the class of 1966 this year. Tomorrow morning is recycling at 21st and Maple from 8 to noon, so get out for that. Um, college graduation is this weekend. Um, the mayor will be having another one of his listening tours at Magnolia Sense by Design on Monday at 5 o'clock. So if you want to visit with um, Mayor Gary um, and talk to him about um, your concerns for the community or your ideas, um, that's when he will have an open ear and you can go visit with him. Let's see. Um, chat. Speaking of visiting with other people in the community, we're having chats with the chief. You know, we just met our new police chief, Jerry Harrison, and um, he is already um, opening his doors per se. He's going to be at Annie Mays at 7 a.m. in the morning on the 18th, and he's welcoming all of us to come and visit with him about our ideas we have for the community, any concerns we have, anything like that. He's making himself available to us, so um, get out and visit with him on the 18th. CRMC Medical Group, it will be having a block party and a ribbon cutting. They're in their new facility at 122 West Myrtle, and that'll be later in the month on the 20th. We'll have a legislative uh, wrap-up session on the 24th, just upstairs in the lobby. I want to go ahead and tell you that at the end of the month, and for the next five months, on the last Saturday of the month, we will be having our summer movie nights again. 
So, and our first showing will be Toy Story. The pre-show will start at 8, and the show will start at 9. And we're looking for business sponsors. Business sponsors, um, it costs $300 to sponsor the event, and we're having two business sponsors per movie night this year. $300 um, will go to pay for the movie, and, um, and actually they cost a little bit more than that, but that will cover the movie. And then the other business sponsor monies will be collected over the course of the, f- the five months because we're hoping to be able to have enough to buy a professional projector. Right now, all of, the, all of the equipment we're using is borrowed. And so we're hoping to buy a professional projector that we'll be able to use for movie nights now and, and for many summers to come. Mid-Continent Band will be kicking off. Um, and Farmer's Market will be starting the first Saturday in June. So that kind of shows you everything that's happening. Um, We always have our flash table over here that has lots of valuable information for you to take with you. Um, Listen to the radio. There are lots of announcements on the radio and a community calendar that um, uh, is played so that you know what's going on in the community. But I welcome you to always call the chamber. If there's something that you want us to help you publicize, um, we're just a phone call away. We would be glad to do that for you. So with that, we're going to start. Like I said before, we always have lots of great speakers from Independence. We get up, we talk about things that are going on in the community, share very valuable information. But today, we have the privilege of having someone from outside of our community come in and still deliver a message that has a huge impact on our community. So at this time, would you please welcome Shannon Katsaratis from Kansas Action for Kids from Topeka. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. I'm Shannon Katsaratis. I'm the CEO at Kansas Action for Children. And I'm going to talk a little bit this morning. I wish I had a more positive message to deliver, but I understand the mayor's message will be more positive. So he'll, he'll leave things on a high note for us this morning. Um, I talk about the ways in which we're investing, or really in this case, not investing in Kansas kids. And so I'm going to share with you some of the more troubling trends we're seeing at the state level. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. We are a nonprofit child advocacy organization. And what that means is that we have a team on the ground every day in the State House trying to make sure that the decisions that get made at the policy level are good for kids and families across the state. We don't take any state or federal dollars. We don't benefit from any of the programs I'm going to talk about today. We simply serve as a voice for Kansas kids. And when the legislature is not in session, I spend a lot of time out in communities just like this one talking to people about how kids and families are doing. So I find it's easier to tell this story in terms of numbers. So I'm going to share with you five numbers today, which I think will paint a quick picture of what we're seeing at the state level, 126,000. That's actually the number of Kansas children that are living in poverty across the state. And I think there are a couple of things that are troubling about that. When I came to Kansas Action for Children, which was actually um, about 19 years ago, um, we talked about one in five Kansas kids growing up in poverty in our state. So in a relatively short period of time, we've seen tremendous growth in the number of kids that are growing up in poverty. If we go back to just 2007, we've seen a 20% increase. And I think what you see from the, the graph, I think the graph actually tells the whole story, is there's a pretty steep incline in terms of kids growing up in poverty. And we know those kids often don't get their basic needs met. When they get to school, they struggle, and often they struggle later in life. And I like to say that if we don't do anything different, today's poor kids are likely to become tomorrow's poor adults. 17,475. So this is the decline since 2011 in the number of kids that are accessing temporary assistance for needy families. Temporary Assistance for Needy Families is a program that provides cash assistance to families across the street, across the state, that are having trouble meeting their basic needs. It helps them pay for things like housing, clothing, um, food, meeting the basic needs for kids growing up in those families. And it's important to know that temporary assistance to needy families, those are all families with children. And we've had a lot of changes at the state level, maybe some of which you're seeing the impact of in your own community, that are 
impacting the ability of families to access temporary assistance for needy families. Some of those changes in recent years, something we call the HOPE Act, which changed the rules around how families access temporary assistance for needy families, making it more difficult for many families. Since January of 2016, when the HOPE Act went into um, full effect, 900 kids across the state lost their benefit and benefits. That's included in the numbers you see up there. Um, and during the most recent legislative session, we had additional revisions to the HOPE Act further reducing the lifetime limit for families down to 24 months. So in 2011, families across the state could access temporary assistance for five years in their lifetime, so over the course of their entire life. We then reduced that to 48 months, last year to 36 months, and during the most recent legislative session to 24 months. So we're likely to see this graph look worse in the coming years. And that would be good news if we were seeing a decline in temporary assistance to needy families, if we were also seeing a decline in childhood poverty. But as you saw in the first graph, we're not. 8,946. This is the decline in children participating in child care assistance. And a good, it, again, this would be good news if we were seeing a decline in poverty. But for low-income families that are struggling to stay in the workforce, without child care assistance, it's very difficult for work to pay for those families because we've all had the experience of paying for child care. It's quite the expensive proposition. And for families that are struggling to make ends meet, you see what the trend line looks like there, um, that decline is, is uh, really um, significant. It means it's very difficult for them to stay in the workforce and put their child in a safe, high-quality environment that makes sure that when that child gets to school, they're ready to learn. 4,198. This is the number of very young children in the state that have lost their Medicaid coverage or are not enrolled. While we're seeing overall growth in Medicaid among older children and also in the Children's Health Insurance Program, which serves slightly higher income children, we're seeing our youngest children, our babies and toddlers, going without Medicaid coverage. Um, in part, we think this is due to a policy change that happened at the state level. It used to be that when families applied for temporary assistance to needy families, um, they were also applying for Medicaid at the same time. In 2011, we changed that policy, and so now families have to complete two separate application processes. We suspect that might be part of what is driving this trend. But I think the bottom line is we have a lot of little kids um, living in families who are struggling to pay for quality child care. The last number, and I meant Medicaid, not child care there, sorry. Um, the last number is the largest number, and all of those zeros are actually supposed to be there. That's 395 million. In Kansas, our system of early education services, things like the Parents as Teachers program, the Early Childhood Block Grant, which serves many counties in this area, um, the Hearing Loaner Aid program for newborns whose families can't afford that, all of those things are paid for by something we call the Kansas Endowment for Youth and the Children's Initiatives Fund. We dedicated all of our master settlement agreement proceeds, our tobacco settlement monies, to these funds, and we promised them to children in the late 1990s. $395 million is actually the amount of money that should be in the Kansas Endowment for Youth. But instead, over the years, policymakers have raided that fund, and there's nothing in it today. We've taken more than $210 million from that endowment. It would be worth $395 million today if we'd invested it as we were supposed to. Um, and instead, we have a system of early care and education services that's really hanging in the balance. You might have heard about it this legislative session. The governor actually proposed to sell this revenue stream. Um, to help fill the hole that we're facing at the state level. So I think it's just important for communities across the state to understand that this money was promised to young children and that our whole system of early care and education really depends on this money at this point in time. And there's not really anything to fall back on now that um, the endowment is empty. It will be very important to have that revenue stream going forward for little kids across the state. 
So with that, I know we are going to take questions later, but I would just encourage you to stay connected to what's going on at the state level. We do an e-newsletter. We talk about policy issues during the legislative session that impact kids and families. And of course, if you are a social media fan, we are on Facebook and very active on Twitter during the legislative session. So thanks for having me here this morning. I really appreciate it. Oh. Apparently, I, I do have time for questions, so if there are any, I'd be happy to take them. And on your table, there is a card that has the five numbers I talked about today, and I hope you'll use those to tell the story in the community. Could you tell them a little bit about parents as teachers and some of the other programs and what they do? Because sure. many of these people are not education-based, and they, they, they don't have a knowledge. Yes, absolutely. So we know the first five years of life are the most critical window for brain development for a child. Actually, the majority of a child's brain has been developed by the, by the time they hit the classroom. And so these programs help, in the case of parents as teachers, for example, they help parents be better parents and stimulate kids in ways that are beneficial to their health and development during those first few years of life. Um, they say they... Uh, a, the most, a child's most important teacher is their parent, really. That's their first teacher. Um, so things like parents as teachers help in the home. They provide home visits. They also provide play groups in some communities where parents and children can interact with one another. Um, the Early Childhood Block Grant, in many cases, provides high-quality child care in a community that's more affordable for families, providing a range of other services. Um, Tiny K is also one of the programs that is funded by the Children's Initiatives Fund. It provides services for families who have young children with disabilities so that um, we intervene early and make sure that child is best prepared for entering the classroom when they get to kindergarten. And we help the parent also navigate what it means to have a young child with a disability. There's really a whole range of programs that are funded by the Children's Initiatives Fund. And pretty much everything you think of is touched by it in some way in every county across the state. Early Head Start, which serves our youngest, poorest children, also receives some resources from the Children's Initiatives Fund. Child Care Assistance, which you saw the graph for earlier, that receives Children's Initiatives Fund money. Family Preservation, which serves our children in the, the foster care system or at risk of being in the foster care system children's mental health, really everything you can think of that serves young kids in our state is touched by these funds. And the, um, these number of people that are on the program as the years are being reduced, that means more and more people are not eligible for benefits any, any longer. What are those people doing to cope? I think what you'll see and what we're seeing in communities across the state is to the degree it's possible they're relying on local charities, but I think what we know is that most communities can't absorb the need that I'm showing you um, on the graphs. So I think quickly charities at a local level will feel overburdened by the needs of families that are no longer receiving assistance. And I think what we also know is that in many cases, young kids are much more likely to grow up in poverty. So what we know is those kids don't get their basic needs met, and then they show up at our classrooms, and they're not prepared to learn because they've spent the first five years of their life going without adequate nutrition, without adequate access to health care, without some of the things that are so basic um, that they are really consumed with not having their basic needs met, and then we expect them to be able to achieve once they reach the classroom. Schools are really overwhelmed by what that brings to their classroom doors. So I think we struggle at the state level because there is frustration around pa families that are poor. Uh, I think there is the belief that adults make poor choices and we want to reduce their access to benefits because we feel like we're punishing them for those poor choices. But I think we have to recognize that 
there are children growing up in all of these families, and if we don't mitigate the impact of poverty on those kids today, they will be the next generation of poor adults. So I think we have to put the kids first and make sure that their basic needs get met, everything from health care to early education to food to shelter. That's got to be the priority of communities across the state, and I think it's important to share that message with your policymakers. with economic development. It seems like poverty is the problem. Then part of the problem is not only teaching and supplying needs, but then getting jobs so that people can come out of poverty. So is your group working with economic development to address the job situation for the parents? So we don't, our focus is really on children birth to 18, but I will speak to that issue because I think educational attainment is one of the best pathways out of poverty. So for example, for children, one of the things we focus on is um, helping to match dollars that low income families save for their children to have higher education, whether that's vocational training or a traditional four year degree or an associate's degree. We have advocated for policy changes that um, ensure that there are state dollars to leverage those family dollars to help match those dollars. It's something we call the kids program because we do believe that at the end of the day you have to give families that are struggling in poverty a pathway out and the kids in those families as well. And what is the age group that your group works with? Is it from uh, kindergarten, preschool to college or high school graduation? We focus on all children birth to 18. Uh -huh. Do you happen to have any <coughs> numbers available for Montgomery County? We do actually, and I should have brought them with me. I was remiss as she was doing the introduction. So we do a project every year called Kansas Kids Count, and we release county level data. Um, for every county across the state when we do that. And many of the indicators I talked about today are available on a county level. I can tell you from looking at those indicators that the indicators from Montgomery County actually look worse on a county level than what I'm sharing with you on a state level. Um, but I would actually be happy to follow up and share the um, county level data that's available. So we don't actually provide any of the services I'm talking about today. We just advocate for these programs. But when I was showing you the number of young children that are going without Medicaid, that is essentially health wave or what we now call can care. So we regularly talk with policymakers about the trends we're seeing related to kids' participation in can care. And overall, while that hasn't been a bad picture for kids, for our very youngest kids, we have seen a steady decline in participation, which is pretty worrisome because kids are getting things at that age like immunizations, which we want them to show up at school with. I think the, there is some indication that um, the growth in the percentage of children participating in Medicaid could be higher in part because of the Affordable Care Act, um, something that's often described as a welcome mat effect. As you get more parents into the program, they realize or the system realizes their kids were eligible. Is it possible? Yes. I haven't seen any um, research in Kansas that um, clearly demonstrates that. We were seeing growth in terms of Medicaid participation among most populations of children anyway. Where did the tobacco money go and where is it going now? So the tobacco money comes in every year and goes into the Kansas Endowment for Youth. And it's still going there. The $395 million I showed you that should have been in the endowment, that's money that legislators have swept out over the years and put in the state general fund. It's kind of like the highway money. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shannon, and thank the three entities that brought her to Independence to share that message.
it wasn't that positive of a message. You're right. And it took us a little time, a little bit of time to get our questions, but um, you could tell by all of the questions that um, we are concerned about our state and our community and our county. So, um, well, it's time for our second speaker, no stranger to the podium. Um, and, and the subject matter is uh, not, not uh, foreign to us in independence. So please welcome Commissioner Fred Meyer. He's going to give us an update on community recycling. Well, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, review a program that really indicates a lot of success. This is how the system's supposed to work. And so to give you a quick history of how this all came about is that when I first was elected back in two uh, 2013, there were some folks that approached me and said, hey, what do you think about maybe getting some sort of recycling program going on in town? And so, uh, good idea. I mean, I've seen it in other communities, so I thought, well, why not? And so uh, there, the chamber and some other folks had contacted me with that idea, and so, so how do you go about it? So if those of you that know me, I'm all about processes and procedures, so let's put something in place to see what we can do. So the, uh, Tim Haynes got involved. The commission as a whole decided this is something that we could look at, and... Uh, we, we put a process in place to do some investigation. So rather than go into a lot of the details, we first thing we had to do was to identify a community partner that would uh, work with us in the recycling efforts, and that turned out to be the city of Fredonia. And so Lisa and her staff got to work and found out that the city of Fredonia was an option for us. Next thing we had to do was determine how we are going to set it all up, how are we going to organize it, and that fell into the Public Works Department, which is Mike Passeur and his crew. Mike, Mike's over there. Mike, can you raise your hand for those that don't know you or can see? It's okay stand up, Mike. I know you don't like that, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and so the commission uh, approved the purchase of a trailer, and Mike and his crew, they uh, worked and built the trailer, and uh, as you can see, make sure this thing works. You, right there, you can see a picture of the of the trailer. So we put the action in. Uh, we put the plan into action, and actually, in February was our very first collection time, and uh, it's from eight to twelve every or first Saturday of every month, out at the uh, Public Works Department out there. Uh, just by the overpass. Most of you know where that is. So, as you can see, in February, our first month, we had 6,740 pounds, which it caught, and as you can look, the cost is equal to labor plus fuel minus the landfill savings. So, in other words, that's the amount of, of uh, tonnage that's not going to the landfill that we're paying a higher price for. That's how that works. March, you can see 8,900. In April, which was just a couple weeks ago, well, a month ago, actually, um, it was 7840. So you can see the numbers right there. So as you can see, when we put it all together, it's a very cost-effective way to operate a recycling program here for our, for our community. One of the, as you can see, one of the things that we can recycle is underneath the yes, you can see a lot of that. And I've been out there. There's a lot of paper. There's a lot of those products that are coming. If you look on the no side, those are the no-nos. So no, no, no. Um, those, are the, those are the things that we're trying to avoid. And for, to be honest, I think Mike would agree. Most people have been very respectful of the no's and um, have been respectful and not brought those out there. So how can you contribute to make this program um, successful? Well, continue to sort items, paper to paper, uh, cardboard to cardboard, plastic to plastic, batteries to batteries, those types of things. And then one of the things that we're looking for is, is because the program has actually gone better than we anticipated, one of the things that we're going to need is some volunteers. So on your tables, I, I feel like I'm pinned behind this uh, 
podium this morning, but on your table there's a sign-up sheet that if you would be willing to sign up to help us on the first Saturday of every month, then sign that sheet up at the end of the meeting today. We'll go around and we'll collect those. If you sign up, if you would, we would hope that you would be available for the whole time from 8 to 12. If that could work for if that could work for you. If not, you know we'll take whatever time you can give us. But uh, eight to twelve gives us some continuity as we move forward. So here's our upcoming recycling dates: June fourth, July 9th, August sixth, September tenth, on and on. So. There's a picture right there, as you can see, and, the other, and when I was out there, I think I was out there in March, when I was out there in March, that trailer was already full, and I got out there about 9 o'clock just to see what was going on. That trailer was already full, and they were stacking the rest of the recyclable materials on the side, and then they, they had to re, you know, reload the, the trailer to get it over to Fredonia. So as you can see... As is very independence-like, we're supportive of this program, and actually we hope that it'll continue to grow and, and we continue to do those things that are good for our environment. Any questions about recycling first? Yes? Who would be the next phase leader? Well, that's a good question. And uh, as a commission, we have not talked about that. Um, I can see an expansion of the program somehow, maybe to two Saturdays, you know, as a potential. Um, one of the things we have to do is look at the big picture, cost, all that type of thing. And uh, so if it would expand, we'd have to, you know, we took baby steps to get here. And we'll probably have to take baby steps to expand it. But that's a good question. And does that answer your question? No. <laughs> no, but... I mean, it, it's going to have to grow some more for us to even consider that. And I, my suspicion is it will. That's a good question. Yes, sir? What's on the wish list for the recycling initiative, and how can we help? What's on the wish list? Well, you know, it's not good when you're the front face up here and you don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> You know, I don't let staff that work for me use this term. I don't let them use, I don't know, but I don't know. But Mickey raised his hand, so I think he knows. Now we need volunteers. At first, we were kind of uh, just, uh, uh, we wanted to kind of handle ourselves to get it organized and get it running properly. But now we definitely need volunteers. In fact, we have got to have volunteers or we're not going to be able to continue the program. Uh, secondly, if, as far as which list, we need at least one more of those trailers. But now we're having to get three trailer loads, and we've only got one trailer. We can make a trailer about four thousand dollars, but we need, and, and very economical, I might say, four thousand dollars. But we need at least one more of those trailers. So any uh, contributions toward that would certainly be appreciated. Okay. You ask for wish list. <laughs> Thank God you're here. <laughs> Other questions about recycling, real quick. Okay, let's look at trees. I was asked if I would look at uh, what's going on downtown because if you notice this past couple weeks there's been more trees planted downtown and uh, we're making progress. There we go. In the last couple weeks we've planted approximately seven trees and as you can see by the uh, Penn Street is right there in the middle. As you can see, we're working to complete Penn Street first. Penn Street will be completed here, we hope, real soon. Then we will follow, and as you can see, those are the ones that are coming soon, which indicates that we'll complete Penn Street. The seven trees have been planted recently. We have 44 on hand, as you can see. And uh, we still have another 43 to, to plant this fall or winter. And uh, we actually have enough trees to take care of what we need to take care of. It's just a matter of getting the time and being able to get trees in place at the locations that they're designated. So um, trees are going real well. And as you can see right there, there's 
Mr. Hogan and there's Rachel. And um, it's good to see Mr. Hogan doing something there. I'm not sure what he does all the day, but uh, it's nice to see him. Actually, I, do <laughs> I can say that because he's not here. So <laughs> that you go to tell him. So I, I know how you are. All right, any questions about trees? Yes, ma'am. No. Now, are we going to be able to do something like that? We've looked into it. It's a cost. It's a cost factor, and uh, you know, hopefully, it's going to rain like it's supposed to rain. <laughs> take care of some of those issues for us. If not, there is a plan to get. If it starts to get real dry, um, you know, there's a plan. Sit, uh, Mickey and staff have a plan to. You can. So, um, and it's a slow release. So it cuts down on the frequency that we need to go downtown and water, but they are monitored and, um, you know, we keep up on the water. We've had good rains, so we've been lucky about that so far. So there was talk at one time that they thought that, that a, an automatic watering system could be put side by side with the current. Uh, it turns out the conduit didn't exist to do that. Um, uh, uh, originally, it was my understanding that they were going to run a second conduit. They had the electrical conduit. They were going to do a second empty one to add that, and that had that wasn't done um, when the whole streetscape was done in what 2001, I believe. So, so that's why we came up with the hydrogen <coughs> crystals. Other questions? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Yes, sir. Steve. You put all the red lines on the middle of the sidewalks downtown, and what are we going to do about that? Uh, Mickey? <laughs> <laughs> the red lines on the sidewalk, Mickey, those, those are utility. Those locates, locates for, for a, a mission on the uh, 88 project. Mission didn't do it. Well, that was for mission. I don't know who did it. Uh, they're located by other utilities. To? Eradicate those? Yes. Yes. The question was, is are they going to be eradicated, which means go away? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. All right. Any other questions about that real quick? All right. Then one other thing that I'd like to mention briefly or quickly here has have you noticed where the old town and country building is and the used car lot is now gone? Yeah, and that's right. Tim and Don Hill were instrumental in making all that happen for us, for the city to be able to obtain the property. So, Tim, Don Hill, thank you for doing that. And then, uh, <laughs> plans for it. Well, as a you know, as a commission, we're going to talk about that. Um, you know, it might it'd be nice to make it like a little plaza area or you know, something like that, so that it's really nice welcoming part of the community when you come in, especially on a major highway like that. So, and uh, what's all gonna happen on that, we've got to discuss that and make those decisions, which we will, and uh, it'll be good. Anything's better than the used car lot. So with that, any other quick questions by anybody? Thank you for the opportunity and uh, I'm excited to hear what Gary has to say about love independence here, but you know, we have a lot to be proud of here, folks. And uh, I think you ought to give all yourselves a real round of applause simply because, you know, we're pretty good. So let's just do that. All right. So we are going to end on a high note today. Um, Saturday, April the 30th. 19 or 2016 not 19 2016 was an amazing day but I want to back up just a little bit and I want to tell you a little bit of information to kind of bring the event full circle so let's rewind nine years ago in 2007 my family relocated from Independence Kansas to Cedar Falls Iowa for a couple of years 
Cedar Falls, Iowa has a population of 40,566 people. It had a neighboring community, Waterloo, Iowa, population 68,366 people. So when you combine those two communities, which were commonly referred to as the Cedar Valley area, they had a population of well over 100,000 people. And every year in the Cedar Valley, they had a special day. And while we were there for those two years, we experienced that special day. That special day was called Love Cedar Valley. Sound familiar? And every year that that special day would roll around, my girls at the time, they were 13 and 14, would always say, Mom, Independence should do this. This is so cool. It's so much fun. They should call it Love Independence. That was nine years ago. Rewind to two weeks ago. I was at a conference and completely unintentionally and unexpectedly, I shared the concept of Love Independence with over 200 chamber directors from Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. And um, it, the event hadn't even happened. It was just a concept. Rewind to two days ago. Mandy got a phone call from the Salina Chamber of Commerce. They had attended the conference. They wanted to know how our event went. They want to have Love Salina. We shouldn't sell ourselves short. Independence is a small town doing big things. Yes, we have our struggles. All communities have our struggles. But our hope should be that at the end of the day that kindness prevails. So yes, we borrowed the idea, and now it's being borrowed from us. Or from, yes, being borrowed from us. It's been said that kindness can change the world. It changed Cedar Falls in 2007. Nine years later, it changed Independence, Kansas. And in the future, it quite possibly is going to be changing other communities as well. It was an amazing day. So sit back, relax, and listen to Gary Hogsett, committee member for Pride, share with you proof that April the 30th was an amazing day. Thank you, Lisa. The Pride Committee is a little tiny committee within the Chamber of Commerce. If anybody would be interested in joining, we could use more members. But about a year ago, when we were talking about what project should we tackle next, and Lisa said, let's have a Love Independence Day. I, I thought, honestly, maybe she'd gone off the deep end. You know, because I wasn't sure what that would look like. You know, what I said at the time, well, I don't even know what that would mean. She said, well, we'll find out. We'll see what people come up with. So I'm going to show you what that meant in uh, Independence this week. Is there any chance to dim the lights a little more so that some of these photos are a little bit dark? So, Love Independence uh, had an early kickoff with a special delivery of coffee from the Midwest Pregnancy Care Center. Stephanie Thomas and her daughter Sarah pulled the little red wagon throughout the downtown, sharing kindness one cup at a time. The newspaper, Josh and other staff, thank you so much. Before the sun even thought about coming up on Love Independence Day, the uh, Daily Reporter threw a special edition special Saturday edition to every resident in Independence as their gift to the community. Uh, we have uh, Chris Moore's grandsons here volunteering their time as paper boys to get them delivered. John Hill delivered uh, smiles and donuts to the wonderful ladies at the City Hall. I don't exactly know about this picture, but um, knowing Jen, she's probably holding them for ransom or <laughs> selling them to the highest bidder. I'm not sure, Jen, but I just, I just suspect that, uh, that of Jen. Our uh, 2016 first leadership class, amazing group of high school students, collected over 100 cubic feet of food to start the Independence High School Food Pantry. They also collected $750 in donations from area folks and businesses to keep the pantry stocked. These are definitely some loving teenagers, just an amazing group. Uh, one, uh, one sweet girl, I'm not sure who that is, made the day of a stranger with a, a tasty muffin from Anna Mays and... His great smile says it all. And speaking of kids, you know, we said, Lisa kept saying, nobody's too young or too old to participate in this program. Here's proof of that. These kids delivering flowers door to door. The uh, women of the Independent Seroptimus Club donated 20 bags of love to the police department. 
So basically each bag was filled with a pillow, a blanket, and a special toy. These are to be given to children who have had to be removed from their homes for uh, domestic reasons or other unfortunate reasons. Um, I noticed our new police chief was getting in the, uh, the mood with his uh, Love Indy uh, shirt in, in black. There's classic white and badass black. I mean, we can say it here. So he went with the black. Um, the uh, Optimist Club shared the love at the park. They had little notes hidden around the playground, and the uh, lucky kids that found the notes were able to take those to the concession stand, the lion's den, and get a free treat. Got one photo here of a young man cashing in that uh, gave it his stamp of approval. <laughs> and, of course, no one likes to spend their hard-earned money keeping their car clean, so some kind soul put quarters at uh, C&J's car wash. And, of course, uh, the same at the dreaded vacuuming. So some people got free car washes. I'm not sure who, uh, who uh, enjoyed the, this more on the pay it forward at McDonald's, but a lot of people got free meals at McDonald's. And, um, again, I'm not sure that whether the, the, the uh, McDonald's or employees or the, uh, or the recipients enjoyed it more. We had uh, flower power at work. A wonderful group of middle school girls asked for donations from local businesses and individuals to help offset the cost of flowers. The beautiful potted flowers were a welcome surprise for the, the residents of Eagle Estate. Quite a crew there. Two more uh, modeling our beautiful Love Indy t-shirts at Magnolia's. Uh, they gave away a $20 gift certificate to one lucky shopper on Saturday. You know this is a fun group our local bicycling club. They had an outing to invite any novices to come join. You've probably heard their motto, we handle bars. I, th I think that's just classic. That's and uh, this is taken after the ride, so they're still smiling. So anyway, I think they had a successful day. Uh, thanks to this group, the basketball team, I'm sorry. Yeah, passed out flowers from Carla's Simple Gifts. Um... Julie Volker, you know, there's an old saying, you can take the girl out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the girl. She was spraying weeds downtown on Saturday morning. And uh, speaking of the uh, ICC Pirates, they were out in full force. The uh, Pirate Cheer team could be found passing out free candy bars. And uh, if you won't tell, I did take one, even though my wife was in Chicago. So I, uh, I did take a free candy bar. They were wonderful. They had quite a crew out, passing them out at intersections around town. The ICC football team got into the act. Um, a great group of mentors for our, our youth and independence. A free football clinic for boys third grade through eighth grade. Had just a fabulous turnout and a, a great day. Our independence young professionals. Make, uh, making their mark, also spreading their love. They also donated bags of love to the fire department to be used in times of need. And I, I couldn't resist putting this photo in next <laughs> to show that uh, Gary is multi-talented. I, I would say he's there painting, but I think maybe he's doing a little song and dance to entertain the crew. I'm not, not really sure about that. Uh, Midwest Real Estate, Julie was spreading love by passing out free snow cone certificates around town. And who doesn't love Brian's tropical snow? So that was a great idea. And by the way, Julie's got her official Love Indy shirt on also. Now, Grand Lodges, uh, Grand Villas and Medical Lodges had their residents out spreading love. Three residents from Grand Villas helped uh, make sure that the volunteer painters were actually painting, not goofing <laughs> off. Once again, proving that no one is too young or too old to, uh, to celebrate Love Independence Day. We had quite a group from, uh, from Medical Lodges passing out flowers. Uh, we saw lots of Facebook posts from the happy recipients of the flowers that they passed out. Again, just a very, very good group. We have a relatively new church in town, the Hub. You've probably seen them around. They were caught by our photographers in three different locations. These kids are making cards and pictures to take to local nursing homes to help cheer up the residents. Pastor Brian and uh, other members helped clean up the movie theater, as I guess they do regularly because they hold their services there on Sunday. And uh, also they helped with some of our painting projects, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Thanks again, Hub members. 
Independence Family Medicine conducted free blood pressure screenings at Anna Mays and passed out water, bottled water at the soccer fields. Atmos Energy, always a uh, strong supporter of our community. They tackled one of the projects with uh, Jerry and the Community Mission for Improved Housing. As I understand it, they contacted Jerry and said, we'd like to do a house. We'll do, provide the materials. Is that right, Jerry? He provided all the labor. Provided all the labor, okay. And they had a, quite a crew out there, and they were a well-oiled machine, I'm telling you. So this is what the house looked like. And again, these houses are very carefully vetted. People that need a hand, like Shannon was saying earlier, a lot of folks need a hand. And uh, Jerry and his team vetted these houses and the people. And this is one of the three houses that was done. This is the before photo. And the porch was in very, very bad shape. It was basically unsafe to walk on. So that was the first part of the project, was to rebuild the porch. So they have a new porch. And then people came out the day ahead to scrub and power wash the house to get it ready for paint. And then turn the painters loose on Saturday, Love Independence Day. And um, Community Chest also supported uh, these projects with a financial chunk. Community Chest, as you know, raises money throughout the year to support local charities. And um, so the Atmos crew really, like I said, was a well-oiled machine. Everybody worked. Is Dave here? I don't see Dave working in that photo, but maybe, <laughs> maybe Dave and Gary both entertain with a little song and dance number. I'm not sure. Um, so there's the house when they finished it by about mid-afternoon. And I've just got to show you the before and after side by side because I can't resist. So that's, that's a basically a day's work. We had others giving out flowers. You go in and shop and you come back to your car and find, find flowers in your car or tucked in your, your door handle there. Barb and Barry provided the cooking for all the painters. They provided meals for, Jerry, I don't know, do we ever get a final count? Maybe eight. Between 80 and 90 people showed up to volunteer to paint, and, and Barb and Barry cooked for all of them. Absolutely amazing. And then uh, the next house I want to talk about is another one here on Main Street. Here's the before photo. And this, you can kind of tell the porch is about to fall off. It's really coming, it's, it's about to come crashing down. So the first step was to remove the old porch. Um, so there's what it looks like without the porch. Started rebuilding a new porch there. Uh, Journey Church tackled this one. They, again, were out in force and were a well-oiled machine like the other. And um, just turned that house from, uh, you know, something that wasn't beautiful into something that was beautiful. And just absolutely, I was just amazed how many people we had out there working and how hard everybody worked. So there's what it looks like afterwards. And again, there's the before and the after. So... Incredible, just an incredible change for just a basically one day painting, and then the CMIH did some prep work, obviously rebuilding the porch and stuff uh, ahead of time. Uh, the final house, uh, also on Main Street, this one uh, also is in sad need of a porch, as you can tell. So uh, that was the first step to get the porch built, and then we had several churches and groups participate in this one. Uh, the Presbyterian guys were out, Presbyterian people were out working. Um, and again, we had people just swarming all over this house and uh, made it beautiful in a very short time. The Rotary Club joined in. So there's Julie again when she's finished spraying her weed killer. She's, now she's out on a ladder along with Steve Wilkin and, and others from the Rotary Club. And actually, we had a bunch of volunteers from both our homeless shelters, which I think is just amazing. Folks that are homeless are out helping other people paint their house, which was absolutely amazing. I had to put this in just because everybody always says how worthless the city commissioners and the city manager are. So, you know, we can accomplish something. We can pose with a paintbrush. And, uh, no, really, almost everybody was just working their, you know, working their hind end off, except for one noticeable exception. I, I don't know what he was doing there, but. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> and so here's what it looked like. Uh, by mid-afternoon. Again, I don't have a great before photo, but there's kind of what it looked like before and there's what it looked like after.
just an amazing day, very inspiring, I think, for everybody. And, you know, this is really life-changing. Somebody that's struggling to make ends meet, have a bunch of strangers show up and work on their house and paint their house. And I, I know the CMIH guys are really fired up and are already planning their next projects. Um, it's not often you go to the bank and get free money, but uh, Community National Bank was handing out dollar bills folded in the shape of a heart, which I thought was very cool. I didn't get one, though, darn it. Ah, I didn't know. If you'd had a big sign that said free money today, I'd have been there. Uh, the commercial bank workers uh, were caught supporting a great mission at the First United Methodist Church. They held a Shoes for Kids giveaway, started by our kind-hearted Emma Stoner and friends. I, I got to say, I did love painting with uh, Jerry's kids over there, but, but this was truly a great honor to be on the stage with the execs at Cessna celebrating their, their 20th anniversary with Textron Aviation. And um, what an amazing gift they gave the City of Independence with a, just a fabulous air show. I don't know that I've ever seen the like. Another uh, demonstration of the great people at Independence Community College. They helped to serve the free meal there at Cessna's open house. These are their student ambassadors, and I, I think you'd agree that they're representing their school very well. And I got free food, which was wonderful. I don't know how many people were out there, but it was, it was a mob scene. Speaking of food, Cole Thornton surprised every customer at Anna Mays with a dollar off their purchase. This uh, happy customer posted her meal on Facebook. That looks like an amazing quiche, but we don't have that here this morning, right? What's up with that? <laughs> Nothing like making a child smile. Somebody, again, some more random acts of kindness. Somebody's taped quarters to the uh, vending machines for kids that want to stop and uh, enjoy that. If I'd known that was there, I would have ridden the horse because I'm a, I'm a horseman, you know. The uh, employees of First Oak Bank were out to help Aaron Schrader and his project to paint his building, which is amazing. They were cleaning up the mess uh, after the power washers were finished. And drive by today if you haven't seen it in the last 24 hours. It's changing by the hour. Another real estate agency hard at work, the agents at Coldwell Banker, helped to beautify the park and zoo sign by planting flowers that will be enjoyed for the spring and summer. Proof that uh, Independence kindness didn't stop on Saturday. The Independence Housing Authority beautified the gazebo uh, area across from City Hall on Wednesday, filling the planters with flowers for everyone to enjoy. That is the last slide. I'm happy to say that you need to save the date. It was just fabulously successful. So many great, great things happened. A lot of things we weren't able to get photos of. But we're planning on the next one. This is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So put that on your calendar and be dreaming up something even better you can do next year. Thanks so much. I told you that was an amazing day. So anyway, um, thank you all for coming. On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and the City of Independence, I want to thank our business sponsors again, um, Tri-County Interlocal, USD 446, and Greenbush. And thank you, Shannon, for coming to Independence and sharing your message. We appreciate that. Please join us again. Absolutely. Thank you. Please join us again on First Friday. It will be June the 3rd, and it is sponsored by Hometown Healthcare. Um, we have a few minutes before we all jet out of here, and um, we're going to do some community announcements. I, Mickey's already on his feet because he has um, at least uh, one person he wants to introduce. Uh, so, Mickey, take it away. Yeah, I've got a city officials, uh, two city officials I'd like to introduce. First, at that table, our uh, new city treasurer, Heather Bryant. Welcome, Heather Bryant. Table, our new billing official, Don Cushing. Welcome, Don. Speaking of Don, Mr. Farthing. Yes. Um, the bike club is going to have a bike ride tomorrow for all interested people at 1 o'clock. We'll meet at the swimming pool for novice riders as well as experienced riders. We'll have kind of a double thing going on. We feel like that uh, we really didn't do much on Love Independence Day except have a good time and 
enjoy. But we did have seven new riders that day, and so we are growing little by little and, uh, and invite everybody to come out whenever they can and ride with us. Thank you. And yes, you did. You extended the gift of friendship to all of those people, so that's definitely worth Love Independence. Val? I just want to give you a heads up that on July 23rd, the Community Access Center is having a uh, Christmas in July. It'll be at the band shell, and there'll be bands playing. It'll be a fundraiser to get more uh, in the way of uh, foods to the food bank the, the, the Community Access Center handles for our local people. And so come out and support that, and they're going to be selling like bag lunches, bag dinners. It's like from 4 to, to 10, I believe. But just put that on your calendar and think about that back yeah, all the way out in July. Great. Thank you. Stephanie? And we're a 513 We help supplement parents um, with diapers and formula free of charge every month with what they can come in free purchase testing. And we're having our diaper um, baby bottle um, fundraiser. So if you want to take in a few bottles, baby bottles, and fill it with change from Mother's Day to Father's Day, return it to the center or write a check or whatever was in there. That's our fundraiser is coming with fun day if you want to. Absolutely. Okay, so grab a baby bottle when you leave. Mike? Independence Convention and Visitors Bureau is on the road today to the Kansas Sampler Festival in Winfield. That's less than two hours away. We're going to be part of the Southeast Kansas Tourism Region tent. Fifteen communities from Southeast Kansas is representing Southeast Kansas. And I'm very proud of my exhibit. We have a new uh, fourth banner. You might remember we had three banners here on display uh, a few months ago. We have an outdoor banner, and it's got some of the hottest pictures about Southeast Kansas on it that you could ever imagine. And if, I would love to see some people from home, if you have time to buzz over to uh, Winfield at Island Park. It's really a neat setting over there, and uh, we're going to see if we can maybe coach a few people over there to come to Independence and spend a little money, maybe stay overnight, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I'll remind you that um, the quarterly Celebrate Independence will be on Thursday, June the 2nd at the Masonic Lodge. Our Economic Development Director is going to serve as our MC, Aaron Heckman, and the title of the event will be Building Up Independence, and we're going to be showcasing some building that is going on in our community. Um, we have three speakers. Gary Beechner from Beechner Grain will be talking about his expansion, um, and we will also have... Um, Dalit Patel, who will be giving us a lot of information about the new Comfort Inn and Suites. And then we're hoping that we'll be able to get a speaker from Quality Paint and Body, who will be there to be able to talk about their new facility that is um, in conjunction with Quality Motors and Quality Toyota. And um, that's a really cool uh, business that's going in out there, and a lot of um, really interesting things are happening under that roof. So we're hoping we're able to get a uh, speaker from them as well. So um, Rusty has his hand in the air. Go ahead. A couple of real quick things. If you've not been out by the Sulphur Stadium project lately, I encourage all of you and invite all of you to go out and check that out. It is going up rather nicely. It looks a lot like it did in the past. It's not perfect, but it certainly looks a lot like it. If you have any questions or comments about it that you'd like to share with me, feel free anytime. My door is always open. Uh, we need about $190,000 left. There's still bricks and pavers available to be put on site. Uh, contact Jeff for that, not me. Uh, and the last thing, in two weeks, we're going to turn about 2,000 kids loose on the town for a couple months. They're all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? It's a great time to share a message. Sure, Janice. Center, and Wilson Medical Center is getting ready to celebrate their 100 years in um, Neodice. So, but we do want to invite um, independents and the community to come and help us celebrate our 100 years. Um, it will be June 4th. It's going to be at the Memorial um, Park, which is by the library in Neodice, and that's 6th in Indiana. 
And it's from 3 to uh, 10 o'clock. We're going to have free food. We'll have fun activities, inflatables for the kids, and activities for families. Um, and then we also have a concert in the park, um, Haywire, and there will be other um, local entertainment. And one of Independence um, that I do know is going to be performing is going to be um, Lily Taylor, which is Andy and Amy Taylor's daughter. She, they, she will be performing. So we are um, gearing up for that, so be watching for ads in the paper. In fact, I think there was one just recently on um, 101 things to do in, in Independence or Southeast Kansas. So. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. You're all invited. Thank you. Congratulations on 100 years. Thank you. We appreciate you providing health care to independents. Anybody else? Okay, so before you leave, don't forget to fill out your comment cards if you have something you want to share with us. Don't forget to take your program with you because on the back side is a calendar. Don't forget to sign up if you're interested in helping with uh, recycling. And don't forget to have a good weekend. Thank you for coming.